while I was in college, I, I decided to go out for sushi with a bunch of my friends. And there was a handful of us. And after we ate, we are just talking and just hanging out around the table. And I picked up with my chopsticks like this massive piece of wasabi. It was like the size of a golf ball, maybe a little bit bigger. And one of my friends is like, hey, if you eat that, we'll buy your sushi. We'll pay for your sushi. And I was like, shoot, I'm like a poor college student. Like, I probably ate about $60 worth of sushi. And I probably shouldn't have gone anyway. You ever done that? It's like, oh, I can't afford this, but I really want this. And so I went anyway. And so they're like, yeah, we'll pay for it. I'm, I'm thinking about that. And then I'm looking at this wasabi. And I'm like, it can't be that bad. I put the thing in my mouth. And I made a mistake. I tried to chew it. And when I bit down, it just went to like, you know how like sticky that stuff is. And it went to every crevice of my mouth. And then I just, and all of a sudden, like, you know, like the horseradish burn in your nasal cavity, like it was burning so bad. Immediately, I felt terrible. I started sweating. I pushed myself back from the table and I took my sweatshirt off. And I'm like, I've never experienced this feeling before at any other time in my life, but it literally felt like my stomach was boiling. I was like, I can feel there's bubbling happening. Before I knew it, I was in the bathroom and $60 worth of sushi was coming out. Um, have you ever been tempted to do something stupid? James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at temptation this morning. Uh, the dominant theme for the book of James and the title of this series is Faith Looks Like Something. Faith looks like something specifically when we face temptation. We should be responding to temptation differently than the rest of the world if we believe in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So uh, we've been making our way through this first chapter of James. We're going to pick it up um, in verse 13. But before we do, let's pray and invite God to speak to us. Um, God, it still amazes me that you have a book and that your thoughts and your words and your ideas and the things that you want to communicate are just right here within our reach. And so, God, I pray that as we look into your word this morning, that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to us, that you would reveal the truth to us, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would empower us to live out the truth that we discover. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to pick it up, verse 13 of James chapter 1. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Again, have you ever been tempted? Jesus' little brother, James, he's writing this, and he's been writing about what our faith looks like when we encounter trials. Have you noticed that there's something about trials that tend to tur turn up or activate the evil desires inside of us? Temptation starts to increase. Um, I shared a few weeks ago about how God miraculously delivered me from my addiction to smoking cigarettes. Just took away the desire like that. I was freed, and it was amazing. Fast forward about a year, I'm in Bible college, and I've been doing pretty good, but then suddenly some stuff starts to hit the fan in my life. Uh, I lost my job, and I was struggling with a couple of my grades in different classes, and so I just, you ever been there, like your emotions just kind of... And I just start like, just anxiety's creeping in, anger is getting turned up, and like depression tries to creep in. And before I know it, it's late one night and I'm walking out of a 7-Eleven with a pack of cigarettes in my hand. I get in my car, I pull out the worship CD that was in there, remember CDs? I put in a like angry hardcore CD, I lit up that cigarette and I flew out in, into town, or out of town. When, when trials increase out there, Temptation increases in here. And thankfully, God's helped me to grow in that particular area of resisting temptation. Um, but the point is, is that I was doing relatively well until the trials hit. And then suddenly, I found myself turning to something that I thought I was completely over. 
You ever been there? The pressure of what's happening in the world, you got the challenges happening at school or at work, your relationships or your, your finances. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And we're dying for relief when this stuff turns up. We're dying for relief. What's the best source of relief? You're in church. Come on. What's the best source of relief? God, right? But sometimes, if we're honest, we don't feel like praying when we're upset. If we're honest, I don't know if I always feel like digging into the scriptures and worshiping and praying until breakthrough comes and until the shift happens. And so what do we do? I mean, maybe, maybe all you guys here this morning, you're all like super spiritual. And every time trial hits, like you just turn straight to God. You're always smiling. You just pray in tongues until you fall asleep at night. Like, but for all the other people out there that may not have arrived at that place yet, think about the things that they might turn to. What do we turn to? Food, maybe? Any emotional eaters out there? Uh, you know, I'm usually pretty disciplined in my eating, but as soon as stuff is getting turned up, then I deserve the whole carton of ice cream, right? Uh, maybe drugs. Could be prescription drugs, legalized drugs, illegal drugs, <laughs> alcohol, right? But things are, things are getting heavy, and it, it, I just got to escape reality. This was my life. When I was 16, 17, 18 years old, this is what I turned to. And I'll tell you, like, it's great for a night, but then you wake up the next morning, and you feel terrible. I feel like my insides need a shower. When pressure turns up, what else do we go to for relief? Sex? Am I the only honest person in church this morning? Pornography? Give me some momentary pleasure, another escape, right? How about we binge Netflix, video games? Like the pressure is mounting and just all this stuff is in our face and it's like, I just got to check out. And so all of a sudden we're, you know, hours and hours and hours go by and you're, you've been staring at a screen and then when you turn it off, what happens? Oh, nothing changed. <laughs> I'm still feeling terrible. I'm still broken. I'm still anxious. I'm still afraid. Maybe for you it's social media. We just scroll and we scroll and we scroll and we scroll. And I'm telling you, like, some of you, your feeds are toxic. Like, if we were to put, like, from your, your TikTok for you page, like, up here and played that for everybody in church to see, you'd feel pretty uncomfortable. Yeah? <laughs> Maybe not you, maybe the other people, right? Um, maybe for you, it's shopping. How many of you, when things are tough, you're just like, you just open up Amazon, and you just, oh, I'm shopping. I just gotta buy something. You're having a rough day, and that's what's gonna make us happy, right? Of course it's gonna make us happy, because what happens? The package comes, you open it, and then, oh wait, I'm not any happier, <laughs> right? A Couple days go by, you forgot you even bought it. Why do we choose those things? Why is it that we get into these cycles where shopping and food and drugs and video games and Netflix and social media, like why? In the front of our brain, there's a dopamine center. And when you press that button, there is a temporary release of pleasure. It feels good. But then we have something called buyer's remorse, right? Sin is kind of like that wasabi, right? $60 sounds great until you're in the bathroom. To be clear, I'm, I'm not saying that all those things that I just listed, that all those are sinful things. Um, some are, obviously, like drugs and porn and stuff, but not all of it. I have Netflix. I shop on Amazon. But what is sinful is this. I want to point this out. What is sinful is idolatry. An idol is not just a statue that you bow down to. An idol is anything that you turn to in place of God. Anything that you're turning to, and I'm believing that this thing is going to provide me the comfort and the relief that I need in place of God. That's idolatry. We get into trouble when we start turning to substitutes. Jesus said in John 15, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He actually said, I am the true vine. I'm the true vine. And what's the implication there? There's imitation vines. There's some imitation vines. There's all these other things out here that are promising and saying, hey, if you connect to me, if you connect to me, I'm going to satisfy. Here's the joy. Here's the life. Here's all the things that you're looking for. It's right here. But they're all imitation vines, and none of them ever satisfy. They're all dead ends. Jesus Christ is the only one who can truly satisfy. By the way, is temptation sin? 
Some of you, you have a tender conscience. And so you're tempted, and then the enemy comes and whispers in your ear and is like, I can't believe that you even, you even are thinking that. I can't even believe you, did, you like that? And, and before you feel defeated and terrible, before you ever did anything, that's Satan, okay? Can I tell you, that's the accuser. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan stands before the Father and accuses the brothers and sisters day and night. That's Satan, constantly accusing. You're in the middle of your test, taking the test, and he's trying to tell you you already failed. You haven't even done anything yet. Did Jesus ever sin? No. Was he tempted? Yeah. Yeah. The writer of Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. So sin and temptation, they're not the same thing. Sin is a choice that we make in response to the temptation. So how do we make the right choice when we're faced? How do we overcome that temptation to to turn to all these substitutes? How do we break that cycle? I think first it's helpful for us to recognize where the temptation is actually coming from. Uh, James says in verse 13, if you guys are there, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted, when are they tempted? When they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So where does it come from? James says it's not God, right? He isn't tempted by evil, nor will he ever tempt you. The problem lies within us. It's our desires, our own evil desires. That word desire is a a really powerful word. It's used throughout the New Testament, usually contrasting the desire of our sinful fleshly nature and the spirit or our spirit. And that's the part of us that desires to please God and do what pleases him. Um, So if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, then all you have are the fleshly desires. That's all you got. And that's why there's people out in the world that are like, man, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. Like, this is awesome. This is fun. Like, come on, it's great. Like, it's not a big deal. I'm loving it. I'm, ki- Come on. That's why you have people like that. But then when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a new creation, right? You're born again. So you're not perfect, but you're new. And you're in the process of being perfected. And what you have when you are born again is you have new desires, Um, Paul talks about how, like, newborn babies, you crave pure spiritual milk, which is the Bible, the Word of God. Um, So how many of you know that when a baby's born, you don't have to teach it to be hungry? You don't have to teach it to have an appetite. That baby's crying until it gets something in its mouth, right? (laughs) And so so the same is true, that um, when you are born again, suddenly you have this appetite to read the Bible. You have this appetite to pray. And the sinful things that you, should, you view sin a little differently, right? The, the sinful things that you used to be proud of and that you used to be engaged in all the time and you loved that, man, suddenly you just don't find the same joy in those things anymore. You actually, um, there's, there's something in you that finds those things repulsive and disgusting. Um, and so that's why a sinning Christian is a miserable Christian, because you're new, you've changed, your desires have changed. And Paul paints the picture in Romans that, that we have these two forces at work within us, that we have our, our fleshly nature, and then we have really what's the stronger of the two desires is our desire to please God and um, our spirit, right? But the, the flesh is trying to keep us from doing the things that we really wanna do. Some people will say though, I don't know if you've heard people say, well, it's, the problem's not me, the problem's Satan. It's not, like, we always, you know, we're, we're good at pointing the finger. It's, it's Satan's fault. It's not mine. It's the enemy. Like, I'm the victim here. Man, I, I'm not, it's not my fault that I'm sinning. Like, Satan just won't leave me alone. But James would say, no, 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 no. Each person's tempted when by their own evil desire they're dragged away and enticed. In other words, there's no way for Satan to tempt you unless first you have an evil desire for him to appeal to. Temptation has no power without desire. I'll put it this way. Um, I hate sushi, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't hate sushi. I hate salmon, okay? Salmon sushi is actually really good. But my, in my opinion, when you cook the salmon, it brings out the nasty, okay? Um, but it's funny because every time somebody hears that, they'll say, oh my gosh, well, you've just never, no, nah, you've never had it the way my dad makes it. Or you need to go to such and such restaurant. Come on, like, oh. Uh. But you don't realize, like, it's disgusting. 
There is no desire. There's no way you can tempt me to try Satan because I, or try Satan, yeah. That's true as well. There is no way that you can tempt me to try salmon because I have zero desire for it. Satan can't get you to do anything that you don't already have a desire for. We're dragged away by our own evil desire and enticed. Enticing, it's a fishing term. It's the picture of a fishing lure. There's bait and there's the hook. We all got different bait. We all got different things that we're tempted to go after. And can I encourage you? Don't judge somebody else just because their bait's different, right? Man, I can't believe you're out there drinking, getting drunk all the time. Well, I can't believe you're so judgmental and proud. So we're even, right? Like, we all have the bait that we're resisting. We all have the temptation. We all have this stuff that we are fighting. And listen, Satan's got a big tackle box. And he knows exactly which lure to float right in front of you. The difference between you and a fish, though, is that you have a brain. The fish looks at the bait and is like, oh, right? But you and I, like, we got to pay attention, close attention to that hook. Because what happens when you bite the hook? Dopamine hit for a second, man, that feels good, until you realize you're being drugged somewhere you don't want to go. Satan is willing to give you a little bit of pleasure up front so he can inflict a tremendous amount of pain later. In sin, it will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. I was thinking about this, and just a side note, I don't, I don't think Satan's afraid of pastors. I don't think Satan's afraid of, of uh, Bible teachers. I don't think he's afraid of people who claim to be Christians. You know who I think Satan's afraid of? Servants. Or as the scripture puts it, bond slaves. And the reason why is because a servant wants nothing except to please his master. If you and I could come to the place where all we want is just to please Jesus, Satan will have no, nothing on us. I don't know that any of us are there in this moment, but that's our goal, right? That's my goal is that I would be in a place where Jesus, all I want is to please you. I want every desire, everything in my heart that I'm just, that it's something that brings you glory. So what's next? James goes from this fishing analogy to a motherhood analogy. Look at the progression of temptation and sin. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. So moms, ideally, how is a child conceived? What is the order here? Women, you meet a man. Yes, we tracking? You meet a man, you get married, I just got to say, none of this living together and then sleeping together and then God's order is important, okay? Um, it's not to say that there isn't grace for children that, who are born in a different circumstance. Um, God's grace is there, but the ideal, God's ideal and the best case scenario for that child is that woman, women, you meet a man, you get married, then you live together, then you sleep together, then a child comes, right? And in the same way that we can birth life, James is saying we can give birth to death. But again, where does it start? You meet somebody, you start talking. So in light of that, should you start talking with your temptation? Should you flirt with your temptation? Should you date your temptation? Should you marry and sleep with your temptation? All it's going to do is birth trouble and pain, death. So what do we do? This is my, my biggest encouragement to you if you're struggling in a certain area is to create boundaries. Um, I know that flirting leads to dating and dating, before I know it, I'm living with my sin, we're married and I can't get out of this house, right? And so, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to flirt. I'm not gonna even come near. I'm not even gonna start to go down that direction. I'm not gonna move that thing into my house because I know it's just gonna birth death and pain. There's a progression you guys know nobody wakes up one morning and is like, I'm having an affair today. It starts with an evil desire for someone who's not your spouse. And then you start thinking about it. And then you start talking with them a little bit more. And then you start flirting. And then before you know it, eventually, you have destroyed yourself, destroyed your marriage, destroyed your family. You start with what feels like an innocent nibble and then before you know it, the hook's in your mouth and the enemy is dragging you away where you don't want to go. 
And once he gets you in his hands, it's over, right? You're getting thrown on the grill. Our sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. Um, how many recognize that what you feed grows? And what you starve dies. Uh, Crystal, amazing administrator among many other hats that she wears around here. She was pointing out to me this last week that we've got um, some plants around here that nobody's been feeding. Nobody's been watering or taking care of. And so we got some dead plants around here. Um, and so that is my encouragement to you for your evil desires. Would you stop feeding it? You could kill it if you stop feeding it. But if you keep giving in and giving in, guess what? That desire grows and grows and it's on your mind more and more. And then as your pastor, I I have to tell you, please, please don't take sin lightly. The Apostle Paul says this, and this should be sobering for us. He says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't go to heaven. Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. Remember, idolaters are those who turn to substitutes instead of God to find their pleasure and comfort, right? Nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So you have to know that if you've put your faith in Jesus, he's cleansed you of those things. Ari referenced uh, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll, con- he'll forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But the, th- the, the truth here is that if you and I get, are forgiven and cleansed, but we go back and we enslave ourselves into this cycle and this pattern of sin again and again, then we will not inherit the kingdom. James is super practical in his teaching, and he's telling us how it is that you can't just claim to have faith. I believe, right? Your faith has to express itself in the way that you live, and if it doesn't, it's not the kind of faith that can save you. Real saving faith is a faith that turns to God, that trusts him, leans on him, and obeys him. You guys still with me? We're going to get into some good news. Verse 16, James says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Why does he say don't be deceived? Deceived into believing what? Here's the lie I think we believe. Pay attention to this. Sin is not that bad, and God is not that good. That's the lie. Sin's not that bad. And God, I don't think God's that good. But we just saw that sin clearly kills Sin is, is that bad, right? Did I get an amen? But is God really that good? Verse 13, he says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God isn't tempting you. As a matter of fact, we learn from the rest of scripture, this is how good he is. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I just have to say a side note about this passage. This is the one that everybody takes out of context and says God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, That's not true about every context. God actually always gives us more than we can handle so that we're forced to lean on him, trust in him, and then when he shows up and everything goes well, he gets the glory and not us. He always gives us more. The one area where he never gives you more than you can handle is temptation. He will never give you more temptation than you can handle. And he'll also provide a way out. One of the biggest uh, lies when temptation hits is, it's too strong, I can't resist. I'm just an addict, I just can't. Okay, Uh, that's a lie. The promise of God is that no temptation will come that he has not given you the strength to resist. It's good news. And what's our power to resist? What is the source of that power? The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. It's by the spirit, Romans 8 says, that we put to death the misdeeds of the body. Um, And so when the trials heat up, let's look to God. He's good. He's always going to provide a way out. Look for it. There's always a way out when you're facing that temptation. And he's going to provide, he has provided the Holy Spirit for us to empower us to choose that way out. When we're tempted, we we have two paths that we can take. Very clear. And each has its own destination. I can give in to my sinful desires I can take the bait and the hook, or I can choose to resist that temptation, 
take the way out, please God, be upgraded, rewarded, all those things. One path leads to death, the other leads to life. And he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. What he's saying is that God isn't the problem, he's the solution. God's so much better. He's the source of every good and perfect gift. He gave us birth. So what is he talking about when he says he gave us birth through the word of truth? In other words, when you heard the gospel, the truth, you and I believed, and then we were born again, right? And so he's saying we've been born again, and now we can experience the fullness of life that God has for us. Look at the difference between the distant land and the father's house. We looked at the story of the prodigal son last week a little bit. Where did the prodigal son find all that he was looking for? The distant land or the father's house? The father's house. When he went to the distant land, all that resulted in was him being broke and starving. But then when he comes home to his father's house, he gets the warm embrace and love of his father. He gets community that he's with. Everybody's partying and celebrating. There's all the joy that he was longing for right in front of him. And then he's got way more blessings than he could ever ask for. Every good and perfect gift is from every good and perfect gift, anything that's truly good that you've ever experienced, it's not been out there, but it's been from up there. It's all from God. And the great news is that God is not like you and me. He's not up one moment, oh yeah, here, and then the next, like, eh, I don't think so. He's not up and down. This is what James says. He says that he is the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Y'all have seen those time lapses where the sun's going and the shadows are just like, Woo. that's not God. He's the light that's unchanging and constant and never goes dim and never goes out. He's always generous. He's always good. He's always for us. He's always with us. Amen? I want to invite the worship team to come back up. Have you ever watched a deceiving commercial for a product? Like they make it look amazing. You're looking at this thing and you're like, dang, a can of soda can do that. You know, like the sun comes out when you crack that thing open and like everybody wants to be your friend. Or like those Axe body spray commercials, you know, it's like, dude, if I spray that on, like 200 women are gonna start running from everywhere. And then you buy the thing, you crack the can and it's like, wait, what? Nothing happened, <laughs> right? Like, this is, this is a joke. Um, in, in Psalms, uh, the psalmist says, come magnify the Lord with me. And there's two ways that we can magnify something. One, we can magnify it with a microscope. And with a mi microscope, we're trying to make something that's really small appear way bigger than it is. This is what advertising is really good at. Here's something really small, but we're going to make it look so good. And this is exactly what Satan does with our temptation and the pleasure. Look at how much pleasure there is. It's going to be amazing, but it's really, hmm, right? When the psalmist says, come, magnify the Lord with me, he's talking about the other kind of magnification, and that is when we magnify something with a telescope. When you look through a telescope, you're trying to catch a glimpse of how big and massive those things actually are. See, our hope and our prayer is that when we come and we gather together in all of our worship songs that we sing and in all of our preaching and in all of the testimonies that we share about all the things that God's done, our hope and desire is that we would just catch a glimpse of how big and amazing and good God actually is. My prayer every time that you come together, that you come to this place, my prayer is that God would open up your eyes to see Jesus. Because when you see him, you find that he's irresistible and you're just drawn in. And the other stuff that you were turning to, it loses its appeal, doesn't it? Will you stand with me? C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author and thinker, he used this illustration and he, of this line. And he said, on one side of the line, you have permissible living. Like these are things that are okay. On the other side of the line, you have sin. And as Christians, we spend a lot of our time and energy trying to push up against that line. Man, is, is it okay? Can I still be a Christian and watch that movie? Can I still be a Christian and live with my boyfriend or girlfriend? Can I still be a Christian? And, and you fill in the blank. 
And he said that all the while, God is over here. And so as Christians, shouldn't we, we, we are deceived into thinking that all the joy in life is found right up against that line. When in reality, Jesus is the source. God is the source. He is the Father, right? From whom all good blessings come from. And so instead of pushing against the line, you and I should be running as far in the other direction as we can go. Some of you, you've been maybe focused and on the wrong path. You've been going in the wrong direction and the response for you simply this morning is to repent. It's a churchy word that just means I'm gonna change my mind and direction. I'm gonna do a 180. I'm gonna turn my back on my sin and my junk and I'm gonna pursue God and seek to find joy and satisfaction in him. And if you've been, if you're here and you know you've been stuck in a pattern of sin, maybe you've kept it secret. For you, it's time to not only repent, but to come clean. Um, Ari referenced that again this morning, that if we confess our sins, James says, if you confess your sins and pray, pray uh, for one another so that you may be healed. Um, confession is the door that freedom and healing walks through. So if you will open the door and confess to somebody what's going on, it opens the door for God to do what he needs to do in your heart. So maybe for you, that's what you need to do. As we take a couple minutes to worship, you need to grab a hold of somebody and pull them aside and share with them whatever's going on. Um, or maybe we're going to have prayer teams after service. Maybe you need to come and share with somebody, but don't leave carrying the same stuff that you carried in here. You have the opportunity to experience freedom. Let's take a few minutes to worship and, and let's make that commitment not to just run from our temptation, but to run to Jesus. Amen. Amen.